In the example we just did, we uh, saw a function that took uh, an empty array and then filled it up with data. Okay, and so because main knew that uh, what the function was going to do, because when we call the function, we know what it's supposed to do. We just know already how big the array is going to be. I have an array of size five. I tell the function to fill up the array with five values, and then I print all five values out. Okay, great. What about this exercise though? So I haven't even written the function here. All I have is the, the, the prompt, which says, I want to write a function that takes an array like this. So here's, here's an array A. Uh, we can see that the size of A is determined by the size of the initialized values. So we've, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine values. And we can see there's, just in case you were confused, it's nine. What I want is a function that takes A and in a new array stores only the negative elements of A. I want to extract the negative elements of A. So in this context, the result the function should produce will be, let's see, four things. The function takes the array A and then, and then produces an array that contains all of the negative elements of A in the same order, uh, but nothing else. And the reason why this is a tricky one is that you might notice that the size of the output array I'm producing isn't easy to tell. Main, when you're calling this function we're about to write, main would have no way of knowing how big the result is going to be because how would main know how many negative elements are in the array? That's the function's problem. So we need to write a function that takes our array A, and of course it takes the size of the array A, and uh, is able to produce its result into an array. And we know already that the way that we have to do that is by giving the function some output array. So we'll make up an array called B and then hand that over to the function and say, use this for your result. But the function also has to send back information about how much of B did it use. Because maybe B, I mean, I don't think there are going to be 100 negative elements in an array of size 9, but there could be 0, there could be 1, there could be 5, we don't know. The function has to both extract the negative elements and somehow communicate to us how many of them there were. Um, so I'm going to call the function extract negative. And there actually are, there are multiple ways of solving this problem. How do we communicate how many elements there were? Um, I like the option that I'm about to describe, which is why I'm about to describe it, but there also are options that would involve, for example, passing in a variable as a pointer and then setting that, or, and there's, so there are other options. Obviously, if it came up on an exam, you would be forced to use one option based on the specification you were given. So I'm going to have the function return an int. Uh, I'm going to, and I'll explain that in a second. So uh, first I'm going to take, uh, let's see, int uh, input size, int input. So I'm going to take an array called input, and I'm going to have it be of the input size. And I'm going to take an array called output, and I'm going to put empty brackets. Um, so I've mentioned already, you are allowed, when you accept array, an array in C into a function, you are allowed to uh, omit the size. And you are allowed, if it's a, if it's a one-dimensional array, this is permitted. You can't do it for a two-dimensional array, but you can do it for a one-dimensional array. If you do this, you're on your own for figuring out how big this array is. And the convention I'm going to take in this function is that if you've called this function, it is your responsibility to make sure the output array is big enough to hold as many of the negative elements as I find. And so in the context of an array of size 9, for example, you need to make sure that there are at least 9 elements in the output array. Because it could be that all of the elements of my input array were negative. But it's up to you. You just hand me an array and I'll work with it. If I make a mistake, because you made your array too small, that's your problem, not mine. What I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through and I'm going to keep track of where I am in my output array. I'm going to count how many negative elements I find. When I'm done, I'm going to return that number. We've been writing all these array functions, we never really needed a return value. So I'm going to bring that back in. I'm going to use my return value as a way of telling you, when you call my function, telling you how many negative elements I found. Uh, so let's see, I guess I have to make up, I'm, I'm going to walk through my array, I'm going to do something like this. Let's draw out an example here. Um, okay. So let's do 2, negative 1, 3, negative 3, negative 6, negative 10. Okay, so you give me an array that contains zero or more negative elements, and you give me some place to put my output. Uh, okay. 
And what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to walk through my original array from left to right. So I'm going to have an index that points in my original array. But I'm also going to keep track of where is the next available space in my output array? Because the two arrays may not line up. Um, OK, and then as I walk, I will check, is this element negative? The answer is no. So I keep going. OK, let's take a look at this element. Notice that the two indices are not lining up anymore. Is this element negative? Yes. If it's negative, I put it in the next available space in my output array, and I move along my index to keep to the next open position. OK, then I move up and I say, is this element negative? Nope. So I keep going. Is this element negative? Uh, yes. So copy it to the next available space, and then move this up by 1. And then I would copy in the 6, and then I would copy in the negative 10. And when I'm done, the index that I keep into my output array will always refer to the first available index. But you might notice that the first available index also happens to be the index, the, the number of that is the number of negative elements I found. In fact, the index of the first available space will always equal the size of the array up to that point. Um, and so what I'll do when I'm done is I will return the value of the index I ended up with. The, another option would be to keep a separate variable for output size. I guess I could show off both when I write my solution. So one thing to observe is because I, I didn't always move in lockstep, there were some steps where this index moved but this index didn't, I really, really need to have two indices here. There really isn't any alternative. I need to keep track of two different positions. So I'm going to keep two different variables. Input index equals 0 and output index also equals 0. OK, and now I'm going to walk through my input array. I'm going to look at every single element of my input array. So while input index is less than n, uh, and I will remember before I forget to do so that I have to make sure I increment my input index uh, as I go, and then at each step I'm going to ask the question. If my input array at the input index is negative, well now I want to copy this into my output array. So I into output at output index. I copy the value uh, input at input. Whoops. And then I move my output index up by one because I've just used another space in my output array. And I think that's actually all there is to it. So I walk through my entire input array. It's important that I see every single element. As I go, I test each thing, whether it's negative. If it is, I bring it into my output array. Now, just to revisit the point I was making a minute ago, if I wanted to, I know that I want to eventually return the size, return the, uh, yeah, the size of the, or, mm, the number of elements used. I, I shouldn't say size because I suppose the array itself, as we can see, could have a bunch of empty space at the end. The number of elements actually used. Um, I could do this by having a variable to keep track of the size. So at the beginning, the output size is 0. I haven't found any negative elements yet. Every time I add a new negative element, output index, output size, sorry, gets incremented. But if you stare at this for a minute, you realize, wait a minute, this output index and output size are always going to be exactly the same. It's because they refer to exactly the same thing. Uh, so you could do this. As I said in previous videos, if this makes more sense to you, then do this. Seriously, it's not worth saving one variable to you know lose half the marks on the question because you get confused. Um, if it makes more sense, do it. There's nothing wrong with a bit of redundancy here and there if it helps you understand your code. Uh, but I will observe in my case, I actually am just fine using just the index. At the very end, because the index always refers to the first empty space, it'll also tell me how many elements I've used. So I'm going to return that. All right. Now, of course, because there was no function specification, I now have to go down here and write that because the task was to figure out how to get that information out of the function. So I'm going to, um, let's see, b size. I'm going to call my extract negative function and uh, I'm going to give it uh, the size of a, the, the a itself, and then b. And then the function will return the number of elements of b that it actually used. Uh, oh, it called it output size. Well, well, maybe we'll call it that too. Uh, OK, so uh, I, I take my variable output size as the return value of this function, and then I can uh, print all of the elements in b up to that point. So we'll try running that. Uh, I'm still queued up from the previous example here. 
that's a good one. Yep, so for some reason I changed conventions halfway through this set of videos to start calling my variables size, and obviously that's come back to bite me. So uh, it should be input size, not n. We're not working with n in this example. Try that again. All right, uh, and we try running that. All right, so the array that I had contained four negative values, negative one, negative two, negative five, and negative 100, and there they all are in my output. We'll do one more example. Let's, I don't know, change this to be negative 17. All right, and so we can see they're all being copied over, and the function is able to tell me, via a return value, how many elements it used. Now, a note at the end, it is actually valid. You could write this such that the return type of the function was void, and it doesn't return a value. You still have to have some way to communicate to whoever calls the function that, that you use that number of elements, because the function that calls this, main in this case, doesn't know how big b is going to be when you're done, because it doesn't know how many negative elements there were. Um, one option would be, instead of taking the return value, you could make a variable called output size in main and then give the function a pointer to it. So the function could then set that variable. That's actually a valid way of doing it. In general, using pointers allows you to, for example, return multiple things from a function or have a flexible return protocol. I find, though, that if we can avoid it, it's always better, I think, to avoid passing in pointers if we can use a return value instead. So that's why I like to do it that way. That is a matter of personal taste, though.